WNYC Studios. Hey listeners, this is Katia. I just wanted to let you know really quickly before the show starts how grateful we are to all of you who have already pledged money to help us make On The Media. We literally can't do this without you, so thank you. And if you've yet to give, it's really easy. Just go to onthemedia.org slash donate or text the letters OTM to the number 69866, 69866. Look, it's been a challenging year, but we've gotten through it together. And with your support, we'll do it all again next year. Thank you. From WNYC in New York, this is On the Media. Bob Garfield is away this week. I'm Brooke Gladstone with a new installment in what already feels like a very old story. A former CIA director calls it the political equivalent of 9-11. American intelligence officials say they are convinced that Russian hacking of our presidential election was approved by President Vladimir Putin. Sources confirmed to CBS News. The CIA believes Russia interfered in the election specifically to help Mr. Trump win the presidency by hacking and leaking Democratic documents. Donald Trump rejects the U.S. intelligence conclusion that Russian cyber attacks were intended to interfere with the presidential election. They have no idea if it's Russia or China. It could be somebody sitting in a bed someplace. Since the story of the hack broke this summer, it's been hard to keep track of who knew what when and who knows anything now. This week, the New York Times published an in-depth investigation titled The Perfect Weapon, How Russian Cyber Power Invaded the U.S. that collects all the threads and tries to untangle the narrative. Scott Shane, who reported the piece with David Sanger and Eric Lipton, says that the saga of the great election hack of 2016 actually begins in September 2015 when an FBI agent determined that computers at the Democratic National Committee had been hacked by a group linked to Russia and gave the office a call. It went to the help desk, tech support, (laughs) at the DNC, and they passed it to an IT guy, by no means a cybersecurity expert. He was somewhat skeptical that the guy on the line was actually an FBI agent. But the FBI agent gave him some information about the supposed hack, and he went to Google to try and check it out. This begins a long series of exchanges that went over quite a few months in which no one in the higher reaches of the DNC actually learned that the FBI believed their computer network was compromised. There were some fits and starts along the way. For instance, in March... 2016, there was a pivotal event. Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, John Podesta, got an email with the subject line, someone has your password. What appeared to be a message from Google was reviewed by a campaign computer guy, and he sent an email that said, this is a legitimate email. When we talked to him, that computer guy said he had just typed the wrong word, and he meant to say it was an illegitimate email. But what happened is that Podesta clicked the link that was provided in the original email, and thus a decade's worth of his stored email became available to these hackers. Exactly. He's changing his password, right? And so he's essentially sending the Russian hackers his new password. Thank you very much. So they hire a cybersecurity firm called CrowdStrike. And it concludes that two groups have actually infiltrated the DNC, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear. Exactly. Cozy Bear, by CrowdStrike's estimation, entered the DNC networks in the summer of 2015, poked around for months, and took whatever they wanted to take but did not make any of it public. So it was a sort of traditional espionage operation. That same group has broken into the unclassified systems at the State Department, the White House, even at the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So this was far from unprecedented. Then what happens is the other Russian hacker group, which CrowdStrike calls Fancy Bear, breaks in first to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which is in the same building as the DNC, and then travels over what's called a VPN line into the DNC, stealing some of the same things. So I guess Russian intelligence is stovepipe just like American intelligence. How did CrowdStrike figure out that it was the work of Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear? Because 
as you wrote, identifying a cyber attacker's more art than science. You know, I like to think of it as, you know, in traditional law enforcement, a cop might get to know the work of a particular burglar. In the cyber world, there's a similar approach. CrowdStrike sees a certain pattern in the phishing emails that a group sends. Spear phishing, that's when you direct an email to fool a particular target who will then click and let you in. Exactly. And they also look at the malware that is installed on the system That can also identify the attacker. And then they look at the targets in the history of the group. In this case, some of the past targets were the Georgian government at the time of the little war between Russia and Georgia in 2008, the Ukrainian election, NATO. CrowdStrike told us that there was really only one government that would have an interest in all the targets, and that was Russia. Then there's the fact that these hackers seem to be active between 9 and 5 Moscow time. And finally, the American intelligence agencies claim to have corroborating evidence from other sources, which they won't describe, but you can imagine a human source working for the CIA somewhere in the Russian government or NSA might be intercepting messages that connect these hacking groups directly to a Russian intelligence agency. That is the problem, though, isn't it? When you hear of possible human and technical evidence that the American people can't be allowed to know because it could compromise sources and methods, we have to take a lot of things on faith. That's right. I guess what convinced me was what seems to be unanimity among the various, you know, sometimes feuding American intelligence agencies that this was indeed a Russian state attack, and also a very broad consensus among cybersecurity researchers. And I think also you have to look at the big picture. One of the really interesting things that someone pointed out to me who studies these issues is that we see this attack on the election as, well, Russia has attacked us. What are we going to do to retaliate? But the Russians see this actually as payback because they already blame the Americans for stirring up trouble in Ukraine, stirring up trouble in Georgia, and particularly stirring up those demonstrations against Putin in 2011, which Putin publicly blamed on then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Now, a lot of that is great context, but it's still circumstantial. You talked about a lot of cyber experts who subscribe to the view of the American intelligence agencies, but there are some that don't. Jeffrey Carr, for instance, is a cybersecurity analyst we've had on the show, and he's critiqued private firms like CrowdStrike for building the evidence to support their assumptions. Is it possible that the evidence fits together a little too neatly? It certainly is. Anyone who remembers Colin Powell's speech to the UN in which he presented, you know, what appeared to be an ironclad case against Saddam Hussein has to approach every one of these situations with skepticism. I did interview Jeffrey Carr. He wasn't actually denying the case. He was saying it just had not been proven yet. I didn't find in talking to, you know, a bunch of other cybersecurity experts and firms any others who had his degree of skepticism. So getting back to mid-June of this year, the DNC goes public with the fact that it's been hacked by the Russians. Then Guccifer 2.0 appears. Who's Guccifer 2.0? I think a lot of people are wondering. The intelligence agencies ultimately concluded that Guccifer 2.0 is actually a composite created by Russian intelligence so that they could take the hack documents and start to make them public. So in this very kind of irreverent, funny first post, he puts up a DNC oppo research manual on Donald Trump and a bunch of other documents, and he also mentions... I've given most of the documents to WikiLeaks, so they'll be coming out there soon. Guccifer called himself a lone hacker. What clues did researchers find linking him to Russia? You know, among several other things, the copy of Word that Guccifer 2.0 had apparently used was actually a Russian copy of Microsoft Word. And a guy who works for Motherboard was clever enough to contact Guccifer 2.0 
through the Twitter account he had created, or they had created. And when he said he was a Romanian hacker, the motherboard reporter went to Google Translate and sent him some questions in Romanian. And there were questions that came back in what looked like Romanian. But later, when he went to some actual Romanians and said, look at this, <laughs> it appeared that both sides were using Google Translate. Your piece stressed how stealthy and sophisticated Russian cyber power is. It's called a perfect weapon in the headline. But doesn't it seem kind of clumsy? For instance, the Podesta emails were revealed through a really simple spear phishing technique. And why would the group insert the name of the founder of the Soviet secret police in Russian in the metadata of the hacked documents. It was in Guccifer's documents. Isn't that kind of obvious? It is kind of obvious. You know, the hackers that Russia uses are presumably young free spirits. NSA recruits its hackers at, you know, hacker conferences now. <laughs> and the other possibility is that it may be Putin is perfectly happy to have the U.S. government know this is his work. I think the reference to cyber attacks being a perfect weapon, when you think about Russia as an ailing economy now with low oil prices and unable to use its nuclear arsenal, thank God, you know, to compete, cyber for a relatively small cost allows Russia to have very significant influence, as we see, to raise questions about the legitimacy of the election. That's quite an accomplishment. And Vladimir Putin, who, of course, was a career KGB guy, is a martial arts aficionado, <laughs> understands how you can use American institutions like elections and like the aggressive competitive media against his enemy, the U.S. But don't our assumptions influence our perception of the story? I mean, your piece notes that Putin's a martial arts expert, metaphorically doing jujitsu on us. Is that merely a colorful narrative flourish, or is it kind of rhetorically stacking the deck? <laughs> I mean, I guess I feel like the evidence for that is pretty compelling. When you look at the performance of the U.S. media using these hacked materials, you know, we were much more excited about what various DNC folks said about each other or about Hillary Clinton what perhaps sarcastic or negative thoughts John Podesta was expressing with his associates' coverage, which came out day after day after day because of the way WikiLeaks released the Podesta emails in particular, overwhelmed the reporting that was also going on on the fact that this appeared to be a Russian government hack and consideration of what the motive might be. But the press did report on both the emails and the supposed Russian source, right? So how could it have gone differently? I think that's a really interesting journalism school case study that probably will be looked at for years. We kind of need to examine our own conduct and think about, at least, whether there should be limits on what we do with confidential material that's been hacked and released, you know, perhaps with a very particular motive, either in terms of geopolitics or espionage. Now, The Intercept noted that in 2014, the Justice Department produced a 56-page indictment that detailed its exact evidence against a team of Chinese hackers that were accused of stealing our trade secrets, and that we are owed this same level of evidence in this case because these claims, if true, would have far greater consequences here and internationally. Do you agree with that? If the U.S. government actually has or gets the information, we, we heard that they have begun to identify some individuals in Russia who they believe are responsible for this stuff. So we may yet see a set of indictments like the indictments in the Chinese case. Certainly, it would help clarify matters and clear up a lot of these doubts and some of this skepticism, which, of course, is being fueled first and foremost by the president-elect Donald Trump. If the Justice Department, the FBI, actually came out and said, here are the people, the literal individuals, who we believe carried out these attacks. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you, Brooke. Scott Shane is a national security reporter for The New York Times.
Coming up, why can't the FBI and the CIA just get along? This is On the Media. Hey, this is Jad from Radio Lab. We're having a, a, a we're celebrating a little milestone over here at Radio Lab. We have been doing this. We've been making stories for the podcast for the radio for fifteen years. That is fifteen years of stories about like um, I don't know the science of morality, the metamorphosis of butterflies, the legal foundation for the war on terror. All these different stories. We've been doing it for fifteen years. So check out our latest episode out of the archives, and all of our episodes are available wherever you get your podcasts. This is On the Media. I'm Brooke Gladstone. This week's flood of Russian stories was kicked off by a Washington Post piece last weekend that cited unnamed government sources claiming the CIA was certain that Russia had worked not just to mess with our election, but specifically to install Donald Trump. Most of the week, we heard that, according to officials at a private House Intelligence Committee meeting, the FBI wasn't so convinced. And there is, uh, frankly, a a famous rivalry between the agencies. And my understanding is that the CIA did not disclose all of its most sensitive sources. Yeah, the FBI and the CIA disagreeing on this thing. Yeah. We're falling right back to this pre-9-11, you don't talk to me, I don't talk to you. And the big losers are the American people. Yeah. The fact that the CIA and FBI disagree shows the need for a bipartisan investigation that gets to the bottom of this. On Friday afternoon, though, more anonymous sources connected to the CIA said, wait, the FBI actually does agree with the CIA. The FBI has yet to formally comment on the matter, but this back and forth reflects long-standing tension between the country's spies and G-men. Tim Weiner is the author of Legacy of Ashes, The History of the CIA, and Enemies, A History of the FBI. He's also a former New York Times reporter who's covered the CIA for many years, and he says the agencies are kind of wired for conflict. They have different missions, they have different cultures, and they can reach different conclusions looking at the same body of evidence. Here's why. The CIA is a global intelligence service that has no police powers in the United States under its charter. The FBI also serves as an intelligence service and law enforcement agency. They are looking for evidence of a crime. So, a higher standard. A different standard. The CIA, among other things, delivers analytical judgments to the President of the United States based on all available knowledge inside the intelligence community. In this case, both the British and the German intelligence services have also concluded that the Kremlin has a plot to disrupt Western democracies from the western edge of Russia to the west coast of the United States. The FBI has a legal standard if it's going to bring a case to a federal grand jury, and that is evidence of violations of law of the United States. Talking about these two cultures and these two purposes, there's a saying that after an FBI agent and a CIA officer shake hands, each one quickly counts his fingers. You've noted that they've been at each other's throats for a very long time. The history of conflict goes back to the days that the CIA was created in 1947. J. Edgar Hoover, who was midway through his 48-year run heading the FBI, he wanted to be the guy who ran the American spy service. Harry Truman created the CIA. J. Edgar Hoover was furious. The Bureau didn't really come into its own as an intelligence service until Watergate. J. Edgar Hoover died six weeks before the Watergate break-in. The Watergate break-in happens. The phone rings at FBI headquarters the next morning. It's Sunday. It's John Ehrlichman on the line. He's the president's right-hand man. And he talks to the agent in charge and says, you are to cease the investigation of the Watergate break-in immediately. The FBI agent in charge says, no, I already opened a criminal investigation. Those people had wiretapping equipment. That's a violation of the federal espionage statutes. And Ehrlichman says, do you know who you're talking to? And the FBI agent says, yep. Ehrlichman says, so your career is doomed. 
Richard Nixon was doomed <laughs> because that was the beginning of obstruction of justice. Mm -hmm. The number two guy in charge of the FBI, Mark Felt, better known as Deep Throat, served subpoenas on the White House saying, give up the tapes. So the FBI became a bona fide spy outfit at that point. Part of the tension, though, you say, is that the FBI has the authority to investigate the CIA, but not the other way around. Let's go back 30 years to the Iran-Contra imbroglio, which ripped through the Reagan administration. The White House, the National Security Council, and the CIA were selling weapons to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, skimming off the profits and giving them to the Contras, anti-communist guerrillas in Central America, in violation of orders from Congress. The FBI was serving subpoenas on the CIA. They were walking up and down the top-secret corridors and rummaging through super-top-secret file cabinets and proceeding to gather evidence that led to the indictments of the chief of the clandestine service of the CIA. Conflict. And then Ultra James, the KGB mole in the CIA who operated undetected for years. Here's a drunk who has unexplained sources of income and is driving a Jaguar into the parking lot of the CIA. He's sold out the names of every Soviet and Russian agent working for the CIA. They were taken down to the basement of headquarters of the KGB, tortured, executed, and these were our principal sources of information on what was going on in the Soviet Union in the closing years of the Cold War. But the CIA didn't want to investigate itself who would under those circumstances. So once again, the FBI has to investigate the CIA and eventually slap the handcuffs on the CIA spy who's been working undetected for nine years. Conflict. The inability of the CIA and the FBI to share information was one of the major findings of the 9-11 Commission. In the context of the disagreement over the analysis of the Russian motives for the hacks, does this mean that they still aren't sharing their evidence or methods? No, I think, in fact, they are. However, there are limits to what an FBI criminal investigator can see on the intelligence side of the equation. Because of clearances. Because of clearances and because there are sets of evidence that you don't want to reveal in court because people could get killed if you put the names of your sources and the details of your methods of gathering intelligence into an indictment which has to be made public. Many have observed that while the Russian government is suspected of trying to help Donald Trump win the U.S. election, the U.S., through the CIA, has a long history of meddling in foreign elections. Is there a difference between our meddling and Russia's meddling? There are different methods. When the CIA went out to swing an election, usually the most effective weapon was a suitcase full of money. That proved very effective when it swung the Italian election in 1948 to the creation of the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan in 1955, which has pretty much run Japan ever since. And there was a second method. When we didn't like a government, we overthrew it. We did it in Guatemala in 1954. We did it on November 1st, 1963, when we backed a coup against the leader of South Vietnam. And a couple days later in the White House, John Kennedy reflected on tape that the United States had much to answer for in this. I uh, feel that uh, we must bear a good deal of responsibility for it, beginning with our cable of early August, in which we suggested the coup. JFK was dead three weeks later. Now, let's deal with this theory, that some precincts within the FBI have a partisan interest in seeing Donald Trump elected. FBI Director James Comey has already been excoriated for issuing a letter just days before the election suggesting that more evidence may come to light in the investigation of Hillary Clinton's private email server that came to nothing. Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid even demanded that Comey resign because he believed Comey didn't come forward about the Russian hacks before the election for the same reason. Does that match what you know about the FBI's methods? No, nor Jim Comey's method. The Hillary Hunters on Capitol Hill mousetrapped Jim Comey. Now, 
he made two mistakes. One, in July, he said, there is no crime in Hillary Clinton's conduct and handling of classified information, but she was extremely careless. Carelessness is not a federal crime. Comey screwed up. He then opened the door for Congress to say, you must report to us anything even remotely related to this now-closed investigation. He compounded that mistake on October 28th when he sent a very brief letter to the Hills saying, there's this new cache of emails connected to Huma Abedin, who is Hillary Clinton's right-hand woman. We don't have a search warrant to open these yet, but they're there. Was he duty-bound to do that? I'm afraid he was. That letter was then leaked about nine nanoseconds later by a member of Congress and then became, in Comey's own words, misinterpreted. So if the CIA is looking for intelligence information and the FBI is looking for actionable information, where's the FBI going to go with this? There are going to be two chapters in the story unfolding in the next two months. The Obama administration has promised some kind of accounting of what it knows before midnight on the 20th of January. Chapter two is how this story unfolds after Donald Trump becomes the president at noon on January 20th. He controls who runs the CIA. He can't fire the head of the FBI without cause. Jim Comey is standing all six foot eight of him. And we are in the ironic position of Jim Comey and the FBI standing between the president of the United States on one side and conceivably our civil liberties, our constitution and democracy itself on the other. In my opinion, we could do a lot worse than having Jim Comey interposing himself. There is a word in Russian for creating compromising information against people, and that word is? Kompromat. If I'm an FBI agent, I'm going to look at patterns of conduct by both Donald Trump and the Russian government. There is cause to look at his business and personal dealings in Russia. And for that matter, his appointment of the Secretary of State designate. We know that the Russians hacked the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee. They weaponized the information they took from the Democratic National Committee, and they have taken the information from the Republican National Committee and sheathed the weapon. If I'm Vladimir Putin, I'm thinking I can draw that weapon at a time and a place of my choosing. So you suspect that there are actual indictments to come? I don't know, but I will tell you this. In the Watergate case, a bunch of spies who happened to be working for the president of the United States broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee with eavesdropping equipment in their black bags. More than 40 years later, a bunch of spies working for the head of Russia broke into the Democratic National Committee with more sophisticated means of electronic eavesdropping. You have no doubt of that. I have no doubt of that. Mm -hmm. And nor, for that matter, does the FBI. Now, disrupting democracy is not a crime under the ambit of the criminal codes of the United States. But, in my opinion, crimes were committed in furtherance of this conspiracy. We are looking at what may become the most politically charged criminal investigation and intelligence case since Watergate. So, stay tuned. Definitely stay tuned. Tim, thank you very much. You are welcome. Tim Weiner is the author of Legacy of Ashes, A History of the CIA, and Enemies, A History of the FBI. One piece of conventional wisdom voice this week was that the discord between the two agencies was due in part to class. G-men are down-to-earth working stiffs, while the denizens of the CIA are effete Ivy Leaguers. Tim says that that depiction, fostered by Hoover, is mostly wrong. But Hoover was a PR master, so we thought we'd replay a piece exploring that part of his legacy. Gee, but I'd like to be a G-man and go bang, 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 bang. I'd be a brave gang-busting he-man and go bang, 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 bang. 
I'd put on disguises of all different sizes And would I win prizes for telling who spies it? I'll tell you, things have really changed. Ronald Kessler is author of Inside the FBI, the world's most powerful law enforcement agency. Under Hoover, the Bureau created this image of this invincible agency where they always got their man. They did this through the media, through radio shows, TV shows, movies that they controlled. Many of the incidents in the story you are about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Sepetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover policed the agency's image through an office with the impenetrable name of the Crimes Records Division. It was charged with furnishing what was called interesting case memoranda to the radio shows and later TV shows and movies over which Hoover exercised an invincible veto power. He was ever vigilant in the pursuit of good PR. I am your new director. I did not ask for the position, but now that I have it, I intend to give it the best I have. The Bureau will operate solely on efficiency, and we are going to do it as a team. Once upon a time, Hollywood loved the organization. David Edelstein is the film critic for New York Magazine. There was something very, very reassuring about the discipline, the order, the routine, the sticking to the rules. There was something very reassuring uh, about those men in those gray suits, all with identical haircuts. But the love affair had cooled for the average American in the mid-70s with the Senate investigation under Frank Church of the intelligence community. Turns out, the FBI was regularly engaged in violating our civil liberties through harassment, blackmail, intercepting mail, and all manner of black bag operations. That pretty much blew the lid off all of the uh, FBI horrors that uh, Hoover had kept you know, bottled up over all those years. Richard Powers is the author of G-Men, Hoover's FBI in American Popular Culture. Once you have an image that the FBI promoted during the 1930s of being an uh, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful agency that never could make a mistake... It was setting itself up for a terrible fall. So the image of the FBI splintered. Films like the Die Hard series showed up the FBI as officious and obstructionist bureaucrats. Al, talk to me. What's going on here? Ask the FBI. They got the universal terrorist playbook, and they're running it step by step. Meanwhile, the Bureau regained a measure of its old omniscience with a Jodie Foster vehicle. Yeah, Starling, tell me what you see. Oh, he's a white male. Uh, serial killers tend to hunt within their own ethnic groups. Um, he's not a drifter. He's got his own house somewhere, not an apartment. Why? What he does with them takes privacy. And he's never impulsive. He'll never stop. Why not? He's got a real taste for it now. He's getting better at his work. Not bad, Starling. Bruce Starling and Silas Lambs probably did more for the Bureau as a fictional case than any real case any real publicity that the Bureau could have done. It, it, it was uh, amazing. Ex-profiler John Douglas is the model for Agent Starling's mentor, Jack Crawford, played by Scott Glenn. A lot of high ups in the FBI itself at first didn't like the movie. They said it was very, very violent. And when I went to a movie screening, I got up and I said, I don't know what the rest of you think in the FBI. Uh, I see this work day in and day out. Damn, you know, who wouldn't want to sign up and, and go out and hunt themselves some serial killers? Critic David Edelstein says that despite anecdotal evidence to the contrary, the gods of Tinseltown have consistently favored the Bureau with positive portrayals. In the beginning, the FBI was all that stood between us freedom-loving Americans and those nasty immigrant gangsters. Then the FBI was all that stood between us and that evil communist menace. Then when the communist menace no longer seemed so imminent, suddenly the FBI was, was out doing battle with right-wing white supremacists and the Ku Klux Klan. Even The X-Files, which depicts a dark and dangerous place, an agency at war with itself, has proved a boon to the FBI. As long as it seems powerful, the Bureau can't lose. It's only in very, very, very rare instances that the FBI is portrayed as incompetent, which seems to me the worst danger to an organization that thrives on secrecy and that presents itself as 
a model of superhuman and enlightened efficiency. But the agency's rep remains in flux. We have a hair-trigger body politic, and Director Comey is in the crosshairs. Hoover's PR machine is broken down and, in this media-saturated environment, cannot be revived. I mean, who alive today has the skills to manipulate the media amid all this chaos? Well, as the Russians say, from yeni chorta ion tut kak tut. Speak of the devil, and he will appear. Coming up, will the voice of America be Trumpified? This is On the Media. This is On the Media. I'm Brooke Gladstone. If you're a rabid news consumer, you might have encountered a small story that's becoming a big one, an amendment buried deep in the text of the National Defense Authorization Act will disband the Bipartisan Broadcasting Board of Governors, or BBG, and put in its place an executive directly appointed with Senate approval by the President of the United States. So what's the BBG? It oversees the five international broadcast outlets produced by the U.S., including The Voice of America, with a mandate to tell the people the truth. The idea of handing over the keys to such a powerful media tool to Donald Trump has raised some hackles. Politico wrote that, quote, Trump is finally getting his Trump TV, financed by taxpayers to the tune of $800 million per year. And a Washington Post headline blared, a big change to U.S. broadcasting is coming, and it's one Putin might admire. Emily Metzger is associate professor of journalism at the Media School at Indiana University, Bloomington, and she says that the changes don't necessarily herald the end of independent journalism at the VOA. Although it's important to distinguish between the different missions of these broadcasters, Voice of America is intended to tell America's story to the world. The other broadcasters have an entirely different mission to operate as an independent free media outlet might in places where the government does not allow a free press. All of these are supposed to provide... Real information, information that isn't purely invented in the head of somebody involved in public relations for the U.S. <laughs> That's correct. Tell me about these recent changes to the Broadcasting Board of Governors that have engendered bipartisan willies in Congress. <laughs> well, they may have engendered bipartisan willies, but it was also passed with bipartisan support and with the support of the White House. The current structure of the Broadcasting Board of Governors for years has been the target of bipartisan criticism, focused around everything from being administratively very top-heavy to having notoriously low employee morale to questionable contracting practices to questions about the appropriateness of the languages being selected for broadcast. So how did they change the Broadcasting Board of Governors to deal with so many of these things. The current board of advisors is a nine-person part-time advisory board that has four Republicans, four Democrats, with the Secretary of State sitting ex officio, and no single authority responsible for decision-making. So it's a Quaker meeting. (laughs) (laughs) With a $750 million budget. This new legislation appoints a chief executive to be appointed by the president with a five-member advisory board, again with the secretary of state ex officio, and then four other members who are appointed again by the president, but from a pool of candidates recommended by Congress. This fix was all done on the assumption that we would have a more traditional commander-in-chief. I think it's fair to say that it was passed with that assumption, but we don't pass and implement public policy with particular personalities in mind. But we're not talking about particular personalities, are we? Michael Kempner, one of the Democratic members of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, said recently, Congress unwittingly just gave President-elect Trump unchecked control over all U.S. media outlets. I think that is 
alarmist. First, the Trump transition team has not demonstrated any interest in the agency to begin with. For the purposes of this conversation, let us assume he isn't interested in anything. What are the safeguards and checks and balances that keep the CEO from being a direct pipeline actor from the White House? The same sorts of safeguards that operate to keep cabinet officers in line. This is an appointee who will serve with advice and consent of the Senate. The same sort of oversight and firewall that was in place hasn't been removed. The difference is there is now a single person to whom those with concerns about the way the agency is operating can go to get decisions made. As of 2013, the -hmm. Broadcasting Board of Governors is no longer barred from broadcasting in the U.S. Now, we know that initially the statute that kept things like Voice of America from broadcasting here had to do something with a non-compete clause. We didn't want them taking up airwaves that other places could use. But later, Mm -hmm. it was definitely reinterpreted to mean that we don't want to be subject to our own propaganda directed by our own government. That went away as of 2013. That ban had been widely viewed across the public policy community as anachronistic. Digital communication didn't know borders. It was easy enough to get access to that content. We had a lot of people overseas pointing to the irony of the United States broadcasting messages about the importance of freedom of information with a law in the books that said it was illegal for American citizens to consume this content. As you read the coverage of this decision, what do you expect to happen? I think it's a very good thing that we're paying attention to the mission of this agency, to its place in American foreign policy. It has been long neglected, and it requires attention. It is ironic that this agency may finally get the attention that it has so long needed only because we have sort of a non-traditional president coming into office. I don't think this is going to lead to propagandizing of the American public. If you look at the New York Times from, I think it was the 10th, there was an op-ed by John Hamilton and Kevin Kosar about U.S. government agencies essentially propagandizing the American public. And they were talking about the Department of Labor Mm -hmm. and EPA and Department of Justice. There are a lot of agencies whose efforts to propagandize the American public have been documented. There is no evidence that the BBG or its broadcasters have attempted to do that within the United States. Emily, thank you very much. Thank you. Emily Metzger is Associate Professor of Journalism at the Media School at Indiana University, Bloomington. Hier spricht die Stimme Amerikas. Heute und täglich von heute an. This is a voice speaking from America. Daily at this time, we shall speak to you about America and the war. The news may be good or bad. We shall tell you the truth. That's from one of the earliest broadcasts of Voice of America, launched 74 years ago. Its practitioners would probably resent the word propaganda ever being applied to its broadcasts. Certainly, Alan Heil would. He worked there from 1962 to 1998, acting as foreign correspondent, chief of news and current affairs, and deputy director of programs. I spoke to him in 2003 when my voice was apparently much higher, after the publication of his book, Voice of America, A History. He concedes that the outlet was launched more to influence than to inform, but its journalists, he said, didn't always stick with the program. True. It was founded as a propaganda organization to counter Axis propaganda, particularly in Germany, but also in Japan. But you had at the very beginning, among the pioneers, those who believed that The best policy was to tell the truth. I can remember the story of General Stilwell, for example, who said, the Japanese gave us a hell of a beating in Burma. Now, that became a matter of some contention, as you might imagine, between the policymakers in Washington and those broadcasting the news from the Voice of America then in New York. 
but the VOA staff held its own. And later we learned following World War II from some of the Japanese who were interrogated about their listening experiences, that that made them really believe the voice of America. But even in the early going, there were editors who stood behind the contract with the listeners to uh, give them an honest accounting of the day's events. You quote President Lyndon Johnson saying, I know I can't affect the broadcast companies. I know they won't listen to me. I know they won't help me. But God damn it, I have my own radio, and I've got to make that work. And he was referring to the VOA and its coverage of Vietnam. Wouldn't you admit that sometimes the VOA has a problem reconciling its dual roles as both a government agency and an impartial news source? Well, John Chancellor said that the voice is at the crossroads of journalism and diplomacy. I think, however, it's increasingly clear, and particularly in the 21st century and in the post-9-11 period, that there is no substitute for a full and fair disclosure of events. I think that there is a hunger for the straight story. How many languages is the VOA broadcast in? It's broadcast now in 54 languages. And do you count special English among them? Not really. Special English being a variant of standard English was designed back in 1959 to aid comprehension of those listeners for whom English was a second language. It was an English that was composed of a 1,500-word vocabulary. Quite correct and uh, slowly delivered. And also uh, the idea was, in the main, one thought per one sentence. And what could you convey to the world in special English? Oh, you would be remarkably surprised. If I may, I'd like to read from page 279 of the book. Please. The absolutely marvelous poem sent to us by A.V.B. Menon of Tamil Nadu in India. And he called it an ode to special English. Hail thee, special English. Thou art a virgin maiden uncorrupted, simple, easy. Ye ring a familiar tone to one and all, learned and wise, as much to the uninitiated. Simple is beautiful. No frills, no twists, nor pretensions. Ye wind your way to the heart to strike a familiar chord. It's neither the kings nor the queens, but that a very common folk. It is a symphony in prose. Long live special English. <laughs> you know, it, it reminds me of one of VOA's greatest contributions to world culture isn't in language at all, but in music. I think that the most famous and, and certainly most beloved voice of the voice of America is probably that of Willis Conover. Absolutely. He once made a visit to Moscow got out into the great packed hall in the center of the city. And all he said was the standard introduction to his signature program. Time for jazz. Willis Conover in Washington with the Voice of America Jazz Hour. And the hall burst into applause. This is at the height of the Cold War. And there was a standing ovation that lasted for several minutes. Let's talk about the VOA in China during Tiananmen Square. There's a fascinating story about one of the Chinese correspondents, Betty Zhou, who all she needed to do was to identify herself at the edge of this square of one million people. And suddenly the people would part like the waves of the Red Sea and usher her right up into the center and the platform where the pro-democracy demonstrators were holding forth during those very, very critical months leading up to June 3rd, 1989. The voice was then jammed by the Chinese government. This is the voice of America. The following program is in Chinese. And then anyone listening to it can see the critical impact of jamming on blocking information from the Chinese people. I think even the Chinese themselves conceded 
before that martial law was imposed on that day in May of 1989, that The Voice probably had 60 million listeners. It was, I think, clear that its impact was historic in 1989. One last question, Mr. Heil. We have the BBC. We have CNN everywhere. We've got the Internet reaching into corners where even CNN can't reach. Why do we need the VOA? I would have to go and uh, quote David Burke, who was the first chairman of the U.S. Broadcasting Board of Governors, who said that CNN can be seen in hotel lobbies and in industrialized society. It cannot be seen in refugee camps. The U.S. simply has to have a voice, I believe, and that's a voice that reflects us. It's not a voice that's an official radio as much as it is one that reflects America, an American optic, as a West African editor once put it. Alan Heil, thank you very much. Thank you. Alan Heil is the author of Voice of America, A History. That's it for this week's show. On the Media is produced by Mira Sharma, Alana Casanova-Burgess, Jesse Brenneman, and Paige Cowett. We had more help from Micah Lowinger, Sarah Kari, and Leah Fetter, and our show is edited by me. Our technical director is Jennifer Munson. Our engineer this week was Casey Holford. Katya Rogers is our executive producer. On the Media is a production of WNYC Studios. Bob Garfield will be back next week. I'm Brooke Gladstone. Support for On the Media comes from the Overbrook Foundation and...